I want to welcome everybody to uh, the first in a line of series of speaking events um, sponsored by the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. Um, this the series, uh, what we've called the Contemporary Native Issues Series, is in tandem with the redo of the uh, Here Now and Always exhibit, the permanent Southwest exhibit, Peoples of the Southwest exhibit at the museum. Um, and so, you know, given COVID and what's happened this past year, some of these talks have to be virtual, but um, hopefully though in the near future, we'll be able to have some of these in person up at the museum in Santa Fe. But before we begin, um, I'll, I'm gonna like, I'd like to turn it over to Ben Chavaria um, to say a few words and give a traditional opening uh, to our gathering here today, Ben. Okay, umbia kindi. Ah, agi na ko agi na hopi wili ma wili sotum pa wili mani himo. Ah, na wano mo kinka ochi sa hidden anti din na niyo nemo wili ge wili kampo nemo hiwo hiwo wili ge kunta po hiwo wili um taki wito ti jare nemo na wili ge wito who wito can we ge now we said, oh, we the pimpy, tumpy, or compare tumpy, or palma, corinans, or get nunge in get. Now we, we, he will repond, now he will wet get, repond, could our by keyboard. Now we wet get, we who chunk, could our by keyboard. Ah, good. Day. Thank you, Ben, for those words. So, again, this, this series, um, the Contemporary Native Issues series, is sponsored by MIAC. So thank you to Mayak for allowing this to happen. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Lilia McEnany, um, who's uh, off screen right now, um, but she's helped with uh, kind of the logistics of getting this and future events together. So as I mentioned, this is uh, one event in a series of uh, talks that we plan on hosting throughout the year. So stay tuned. We have, uh, you know, a lot of different topics to discuss. Uh, in the future, we'll be talking about museums. We'll be talking about archaeology. We'll be talking about different social justice issues. Um, so just on the horizon, on April twenty second, is a panel discussion revolving around the efforts by Native folks um, to conserve and protect protect uh, Oak Flats. Um, but the topic at hand today um, is about tribal historic preservation uh, in public communities. So I've gathered a few tribal historic preservation officers um, from our surrounding communities to talk about uh, some of the efforts um, that they're undertaking in their respective communities, some of the unique challenges, some of the successes they've had. Basically, I'd like to introduce the topic for those of you who haven't um, had much experience with tribal historic preservation offices, um, or if there's some native folks in the community from the Pueblos or other tribes who aren't familiar with tribal historic preservation or these offices, um, just kind of introduce you to what we, what these folks do as uh, historic preservation officers in their community. Uh, one of the hats that I wear um, in my, um, I guess, career as an archaeologist is uh, I'm the Deputy Historic Preservation Officer at San Aldefonso Pueblo. Um, so this topic is kind of near and dear to my heart. So to begin, I, I'll just kind of briefly define what, a tri what tribal historic preservation um, officers are, kind of the work that we do. Um, so we have and we'll call them TIPOs for short, Tribal Historic Preservation Officers. They have the responsibilities of state historic preservation officers on tribal land and advise the work with federal agencies uh, on the management of tribal historic properties within tribal lands. Uh, TIPOs also preserve and rejuvenate the unique cultural tra traditions and practices of their tribal communities. So that's a very broad definition and there's a lot more that TIPOs do. Um, we're involved in um, kind of issues within uh, tribal communities. Um, 
sometimes issues outside of uh, our, our own communities. Um, but by virtue of having these offices, we kind of take over the kind of jurisdictional control over heritage management um, on our lands. So just a few stats here. Um, um, there are approximately 185 uh, tribal historic pre preservation programs out of 573 or so federally recognized uh, tribes in the US. Um, at the moment, there's 15 uh, tribal historic preservation programs um, in New Mexico. Um, and we have uh, four of those officers here. Um, and the state historic preservation uh, officers um, are individually appointed by each of the 50 states and they are expected to work cooperatively, if not collaboratively with the TIPOs. So each state also has a, a state historic preservation officer. Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of what TIPOs are, what they do, what they represent. Um, and so I'll introduce our speakers um, individually. And after I introduce them all, I'll let them um, kind of speak about their kind of uh, what, what, what they, whatever they want basically about their, um, their programs, um, any information they'd like to share with us briefly, then we'll have a set of questions from me and then we'll open it up to questions from the, uh, from the audience. So on screen, you have uh, Michael Bremer. Um, he's a retired US Forest Service archeologist. Um, he's currently the TIPO uh, at San Aldefonso Pueblo. Um, on screen, you also have Bruce Bernstein. Uh, he's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Pewaukee Pueblo. Uh, that's one of the many hats that he wears. He's also involved in a, a fair amount of museum um, projects and entities uh, here in New Mexico and the Southwest. We also have Ben Chavarria, who's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Santa Clara Pueblo. And uh, he's been doing this work for a very long time and has lots of uh, experience in this realm. And last but not least is Chris Toya, who's the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer uh, from Jemez Pueblo, who like Ben has, um, has been doing this work for a really long time. Uh, I think Jemez has one of the, the earliest kind of um, tipos in kind of the Northern Rio Grande area. So I hope you get us learn from their perspective. Um, so uh, Chris, why don't we start with you? Just wanna um, maybe reintroduce yourself if you'd like and just say a few words about your, uh, your program. Sure. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce myself and then say a, a little greeting in my Toa language. So my name is uh, Christopher Toya and from the Pueblo of Jemez. And so my greeting will be Thank you, everyone. Um, in my little greeting, uh, I, I said uh, welcome, and I, I, I said in my Toa language uh, the program that we have running here in Jemez Pueblo, as well as the other Pueblos, in the protection and preservation of our cultural resources. Uh, not only the archaeological sites, but the shrines and those special places that we that we have uh, carrying our traditional ways of life, and then uh, also protecting the uh, procurement areas uh, uh, in the uh, areas that are managed by you know the federal agencies. These places have never been forgotten. These are places where we procure our medicinal plants. Uh, those things that we need in our traditional way of life to continue our way of life into the future. So 
as uh, Woody stated, um, the cultural preservation in Jemez Pueblo has been going on for some time. Uh, I remember uh, back in the early 90s, there was an individual by the name of William Watley who uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> led the way in the protection of archaeological resources. He was uh, the archaeologist that was hired by the Pueblo of Jemez because during that time is when really uh, a lot of the uh, uh, meetings with the uh, federal agencies, in particular the Forest Service, had begun. And William Watley was the archaeologist that was hired by the Pueblo, and he really had quite a bit of knowledge on the uh, Jemez history and, and Jemez archaeological sites because he had been working out there and, and, and really getting to know the countryside. So uh, it initially began with him, and then um, in 2004, I was hired by the tribe to be their uh, traditional cultural properties project manager. And so, you know, I was out on the uh, public lands, uh, lands managed by the US Forest Service or the, uh, the Department of Interior, the National Park Service, uh, documenting uh, TCPs, traditional cultural properties. Uh, they may be shrines, trails, springs, those significant places or things that uh, Hamas people or all native tribes use today to practice their way of life. And so it wasn't until 2015 that the uh, uh, National Park Service uh, recognized the Pueblo of Hamas uh, uh, for their you know, uh, accomplishment of uh, putting in the application for a TIPO program here to formally manage uh, the cultural resources here on our reservation uh, lands and then to have a, uh, input or comment on our ancestral uh, uh, TCPs on public lands. And so since then, we've had a formal TIPO program here in Jemez Pueblo. And, you know, it wasn't anything new. It was just uh, having a formal program in which uh, we can consult with the uh, US Forest Service, the uh, National Park Service and other uh, federal agencies and, and state agencies as well, state departments, in particular, the uh, historic uh, New Mexico, his historical, the, uh, what is it called, New Mexico, um, the department that manages all of the uh, uh, historical sites here in the state of New Mexico Anyways, it was just a good formal way uh, uh, to, to manage and, and to work uh, with uh, the different departments and agencies to uh, collaborate on the uh, cultural resources. And I, I think that pretty much sums up, uh, uh, you know, just the, the history of the TIPO program. And uh, later on, as we go more in depth, I can talk more about it on the structure and so forth. Thanks, Chris, for that. Um, Bruce, you're kind of in order on my end uh, of things. So if you want to go ahead and maybe re if, you, if you'd like, reintroduce yourself, just then say a few words. Like sure. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us here tonight. Thank you, Woody, for organizing the panel. My name is Bruce Bernstein. I'm, uh, I was, I'm the former director and chief curator at MIAC in Laboratory of Anthropology, as well as the Director of Research and Collections at the National Museum of the American Indian. And in uh, 2012, then Governor Rivera asked me to come up to Pewaukee to help with some programs. And very soon after, about nine years ago, I was asked to be the uh, THIPO for the Pueblo of Pewaukee. And what a great privilege it is to work within the community. I work for the war, um, the war chief and the war captains in the in the community as well as the entire community. We have a cultural advisory group in which we discuss and they advise the program in terms of its direction. Um, and some of the things that we've done is certainly inspired by all of you on the call uh, with me, the other panelists on the call with me. I'm very appreciative uh, to be here with you and to think that I'm uh, doing some of the types of work that you're doing. Um, partly, um, we are grant supported. Um, there is a FIPO program through National Park Service, and that's the way FIPO programs are supported. We write those grants to support the position itself, as, um, 
as well as other grants. We've used those grants to do additional survey work on Pueblo lands, about 13,000 acres, just under 14,000 acres, uh, Pueblo Pewaukee. We have about 40% are now surveyed. And we've also built a database. And what that database does is it's bringing all the information held in other non-Pueblo databases into the village in order that the village can control uh, the information and who uses that information. There's a long history of archeologists working in communities with and without their consent. Uh, but we wanna make sure uh, in the community, the community decides who will work with the community and who doesn't work and what access they have to those prior uh, excavations. Uh, so that database is a very important mark in terms of uh, the, the community having the agency and control over its own history and culture. When people do come to work in the community, they must have a tribal resolution. We have a couple of um, um, uh, dissertation students from University of Colorado working on tribal lands right now. And very much we're looking for their results to be in plain spoken English, not in some type of jargon, but in plain spoken English in order that the community can enjoy and understand their work and that it has a relevancy to the community is very important to us. We also work on all the different land projects, uh, people um, uh, building a new home, placing a new trailer down. We have a very large project in the Pewaukee Valley right now uh, that um, um, Tsuki Nambe, San Alfonso and Pewaukee are involved with, and that's the water settlement project, Amont as it's known. known. It's a very large project with a lot of excavation on Pueblo lands. So we've very carefully gone around and surveyed where those water lines will be, where the new takes will be, uh, to ensure that we're not disturbing anything that's tangible, as well as I think Chris mentioned, uh, traditional cultural properties, things that are intangible, that aren't um, easy to see, uh, um, but are about vistas and different plant uses and things like that. Um, one of, and just the last thing I'll talk about here is um, one of the things uh, former governor Talachi asked me to work on was a land-based educational program. And as I drove back and forth from Santa Fe each day, I saw this sign that said Cuyamongue. And I thought a lot about that. And I thought also about how the North had become this place called O'Keefe country. And I thought about Cuyamongue and I thought that, well, that's not a Spanish word, but that's a Taylor word. And it's not O'Keefe country. You can't have somebody come in and live for 20 years uh, and the whole area be defined. It's Tewa country. So we started a, a, a partnership with the University of Colorado Boulder and Scott Ortman. And uh, he's had his field students uh, come. We do all survey, no excavation at all, total survey. We're looking back over um, uh, collections that are in museums. And uh, the other thing we're doing with the students is we've really tried to familiarize them with the community. They've come and presented to the council. Uh, the last year we had the field school a couple of years ago, uh, all their meals were with the tribal member in her house. She got them lined up to wash the dishes, just like a feast day every day for them. And it really worked out well. They had a different insight into who native people are today, uh, not just um, uh, being archeologists. And if they choose to be archeologists, if that's their choice in their occupation or work with Native communities in any fashion, they'll have a much different, uh, we hope they'll have a much different viewpoint um, of who the community is and who the people in the community are. So that's kind of where we're working right now. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, ben, if you'd like to maybe reintroduce yourself and say a word, a few words about your uh, your work. Okay, uh, 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 my name is Ben Chavaria and I, I serve with the uh, the Santa Clara Pueblo as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, also the Director of the Rights Protection Office. And uh, what we do in our office is we do gather all the information through a lot of varieties of field work and uh, disciplines of history and archeology. span uh, We combined a, uh, conduct a combination of collecting data through online records, internet research gathering, uh, information, but a lot mainly is from oral traditions. Um, again, going out, getting, uh, documenting artifacts and looking at reports. We do utilize a lot of the technology uh, today, uh, a lot of uh, GIS and GPS technology. Um, 
we did start the department, uh, the TIPO actually in uh, 2000, um, 2012 is when we became a TIPO. And uh, we've been doing a lot of cultural resource work since about 2007 uh, here in the Pueblo. It's been, well, I started around that time um, doing a lot of the cultural resource work of uh, the Santa Clara Pueblo outline ancestral uh, and Aboriginal boundaries. Um, again, we will, our focus is to ensure protection of all cultural resources and that, uh, you know, again, that our future uh, for our future generations. Uh, one thing that we do look forward to is our future. Uh, again, we do like to instill all the core values of our people. Again, that is uh, respect, uh, perseverance, Again, responsibility, compassion, and again, perseverance. And that's something that we focus on a lot of the times. Um, my, uh, you know, we were asked, I actually uh, asked people what would our, um, what would, where would we actually be if it wasn't for our ancestors? And again, that's one of the reasons why we always look towards the future generations and we always talk about looking forward to the ones who aren't even born yet. So that is something that we focus on in our work. Right now, um, we do got a lot of, we do a lot of projects on the reservation as well as off. We work with, uh, right now we're doing uh, like clearances for various projects occurring on the reservation with federal, federal funded projects. Uh, we got water lines, uh, wastewater lines, and uh, power lines going through that they're trying to repair. Uh, we also do a wide array of work with uh, national parks, um, a lot of ethnographic studies for our Pueblo. We work with our great, with great sand dunes, uh, Chimney Rock, Mesa Verde National Park, Canyon of the Ancients, Bears Ears, uh, Chaco, uh, Aztec, going down into Gila Cliff Dwellings, White Sands, uh, Bandelier, uh, Petroglyph National Monument. There's just so many that I can go name. Uh, we do a lot of work in the state here, a lot of work in the Galisdale Basin, uh, just protecting and preserving the sites again for the future generations. So, uh, uh, we do work closely with a lot of federal, state, local agencies, but also with the tribes. Uh, almost all the TIPOs in New Mexico and uh, along with uh, Hopi in Arizona, we work closely with. So uh, it's, a, it's a large task. Uh, one of the, I, I would say one of this is one of the hardest jobs that I ever taken the responsible role for, but thank you very much. Thanks, Ben, for uh, those words about your program. Um, Mike Bremer, if you'd like to, if you'd like, reintroduce yourself, um, say a few words about the TIPO program uh, here at San Alfonso Pueblo. Uh, cut me off when you're ready, Woody, because um, oh, I could go on you. forever. Uh, my name is Mike Bremer. I'm a, I'm the Tribal Star Preservation Officer at the Pueblo de San Alfonso, and I've been in this position since a year. I started a year ago, yesterday, Monday. And the second day of my employment at San Ildefonso was the imposition of COVID restrictions. And so I've spent the past year working with uh, the, the Pueblo and other community members and other agencies kind of in a virtual situation. And so it's not, it's not what I would have wanted for the ideal first start to a job, but I have to say that working with the people of San Ildefonso has been uh, quite joyful and quite pleasant. And I have learned so much. Um, as Woody said, I worked for the Forest Service from 1980 to, to 2019. I was the forest archeologist on the Santa Fe National Forest. And I worked with San Ildefonso and I also worked with Hamas, with Chris. And I worked with um, Ben at, Ch at uh, Santa Clara doing tribal consultation from, from the federal agency side. And I, I kind of learned to appreciate the job that TIPOs have, and, a, and the job that a TIPO has is much more, um, even though it, the land base is not always as large as a whole state, in many ways, a TIPO has a much more challenging job working within a community 
And because your ties to the community are frequently um, stronger and longer, and the expectations on you from the community are that you would be um, responsible for kind of the uh, preservation of protection and, and education of their traditional and cultural, traditional and cultural resources. And um, one thing I've learned about um, San Aldefonso is the people that I, that I work with and that I'm around during the day when I'm working, those people are tremendously proud of who they are. They're tremendously proud of their past. They've been here since time immemorial. And that's really critically important understanding the tie to the land that, uh, that um, is frequently not um, understood by federal agencies and state agencies. And so the job of a TEPO is to educate those agencies about that. A lot of people don't know that tribes get bombarded with requests for consultation. The National Historic Preservation Act and other environmental laws require that agencies, and not just your federal agencies, but anybody using federal money or anybody who's federally permitted to consult with tribes regarding effects to their ancestral homelands. And that can be a complicated task. For the, for the Pueblo of, of San Ildefonso, we do much like Ben said, we consult with all those agencies. And I think Chris would say much the same thing. The, the, the strongest ties that you have with agencies generally tend to be those that are closer to you and those that are kind of within the close proximity to your village and have kind of the most potential to affect resources that are of greatest concern to you within kind of whatever you define as your ancestral territory. For the uh, Pueblo of San Ildefonso, our ancestral territory extends pretty much throughout the entire Four Corners area. And, and I think Ben and Chris and, and Bruce would agree to that. But for San Ildefonso, the, the week I started, my direction from the, the, the governor who I work for directly, but I actually think I work for the Tribal Historic Preservation um, Office Advisory Board, is that I was to pay a primary attention to three things. Pay attention to the Pawaki Basin Regional Water System construction. That's the big project that Bruce was talking about, the Amit Water Settlement. Uh, San Ildefonso is the starting point for the diversion of water into that system. And we've been spending the last two years um, kind of gearing up for that. And then the last eight months, they've built the first wells. And then phase one of that system is set to go online this spring sometime. So there's going to be a lot of activity. The second um, task that I was told to focus on was working with Bandelier National Monument. Um, Bandelier sits easily within the, the, the core of the ancestral homeland for um, the people at San Ildefonso. And also finally, to work with Los Alamos National Lab and Los Alamos County. Um, it's a little unusual that in a lot of people's lifetime and memory that a large community with a lot of activity, with a lot of effect to ancestral and cultural resources was placed kind of without any consultation with the community um, within that ancestral homeland. And, and early on, that was World War II, it was kind of hard to stop that juggernaut, but there's been a lot of fallout from that work. And I would say that strengthening the relationship between uh, the Pueblo and the lab is, is critical for, for the people at San Ildefonso. And there's a lot of healing that needs to occur as a result of that. And the TIPO's office feels a lot of that. Um, it's, it's a really, um, it's a powerful thing. It's, I don't know that there's any other tribe that has that kind of thing imposed. Uh, Santa Clara may feel some of it and Hamas may feel some of that. Pawaki may also feel some of that. But it's, uh, it's an incredible imposition. And it's also it just sits on top of resources that were not that were used by ancestors of the, of the village not that long ago in the minds of the people who were there. Um, the Pueblo does probably 300 to 400 consultations with other agencies in a year and people don't see that. That's kind of the day-to-day -day job. Um, but also what I was hoping would happen when I took this job was is that we could start to do uh, an active inventory program to, to, to kind of see what the resource looked like on the Pueblo. Um, when I started on the Pueblo, they informed me that they had gotten a large grant to um, develop and 
consider construction of a, of a museum and cultural center for, for the Pueblo. And that's been starting up. And I think that's an exciting venture for the people in the Pueblo. They, they want to have some place to showcase their history and who they are. And the, the big driver of this um, project is not the TIPO, it's not the governor, it's the community. And that's, that's a neat thing. Um, the, let's see, before the TIPO, the TIPO program, I, Woody, I think we're the youngest TIPO program in the state. This we program was, was, was started in 2017. That's when it was certified by the National Park Service. Okay. Woody, along with Tim Martinez and other members of the community, um, working with Brad Vieira, some people may know on the line, um, submitted the original grant application to create the TEPO office. And that was created in, in 2017 under, was it under Terry or James? Uh, James was, Mountain, governor of our under, under Governor James Mountain. And that, prior to that time, a lot of, a lot of people don't understand that before TIPO's offices occur at Pueblo's, the governor's office gets drowned in requests for consultation for the National Historic Preservation Act, as well as NEPA, as well as Fish and Wildlife. And what a TIPO can do is take some of that, some of that um, burden away from, from the governor's office or the other environmental programs. Now, San Ildefonso used to do a lot of that consultation through their division of Enro environmental and cultural uh, preservation. That office, however, was created primarily to deal with um, effects, environmental effects and cultural effects from, from the lab. And so the, there's a, the division now is, is we deal with section 106 compliance and then the environmental office deals with other kinds of environmental issues and other critical cultural resource concerns. So it's um, what's become clear to me in the year that I have hardly moved out of my office or away from my house <laughs> is, is that there's still a lot to do in this job. And it, there's, a, there's a lot that needs to be done. One of the big focuses I'm hoping for the future is to work on Bruce's, Bruce's education program on Powake and, and the stuff that Ben has done with, um, with uh, teenagers and, and young, younger youth is something to be emulated and something that we'd like to do. And I, I think you've done some too, Chris, at Hamas too. Hamas has always had a kind of an active preserva youth preservation program. Um, the, starting with, with, with Chris and with a, a, one of, another archaeologist who used to work there, Matt Liebman, who I saw on the, the attendee list. So I'll shut up now, Woody, uh, and let you ask your questions. Okay, Mike, thanks for, um, for Mike for um, kind of talking about what we do in our office here at San Aldefonso and, for the, and to the other TIPOs for sharing um, a little bit in the kind of brief time that they had, um, sharing what they could about their, their programs. Um, as you can see, uh, these offices are engaged in a wide variety and diversity of projects that we're just barely kind of um, getting a feel for here. And um, I, I think it's important to note, just look at the the makeup of these four particular TIPOs on your screen. We have uh, two TIPOs who were born and raised in their communities with their own traditions, speak their language, understand um, kind of their own cultural values. And um, they, they take that to their, to the work that they do uh, within the TIPO office. And on the other hand, you have two non-native um, uh, people working within the community who I think by this point have been more or less accepted as part of the community because they, they bring to uh, the job, um, um, even though they're not tribal members or weren't you know, born, raised in the Pueblo like uh, the other two Tipos were, they bring with them an understanding of, uh, of those values. They respect them. Uh, therefore, they've been uh, accepted by the communities that they work for and entrusted really to, to uh, lead, uh, lead the community um, as far as uh, tribal historic preservation matters 
um, are concerned. So there's, I think in New Mexico, I, I don't know the exact numbers of, um, or the exact kind of demographic of uh, the makeup of TIPOs, but I think it's around maybe half are native, half are non-native and are from their own communities. Um, so at, um, what ideally I think each TIPO is striving for is to have somebody from their own communities to kind of take up an interest in tribal historic preservation, whether that's through archeology, span through ethnography, through anthropology, and maybe one day strive to become a tribal historic preservation officer themselves, um, because it really is important to have that um, internal perspective that somebody like uh, Ben or Chris brings along. But at the same time, we also value the work that our partners and allies like uh, Mike and Bruce, what they, what they can bring to the table. So kind of with that in mind, um, one question I'll present to the panelists is how do each of uh, your communities differ in terms of community focus and what the leadership or what the community um, um, expects from a tribal historic preservation office or a tribal historic preservation officer? I, I, th I think that um, I, I talked a little bit about it there that the, the, our, our focus on the lab and on Bandelier and kind of really um, close in is, is a product both of the youth of the program and also kind of, of the focus of the community. I'm not sure that the community fully yet understands what a TIPO does, um, although you and Brad did a pretty good job of doing education at the beginning, but because the program's so young, we still have some, some catch up to do. Um, I, for those who don't know, is um, San Ildefonso is one of six uh, Tewa speaking communities in the Tewa Basin, not in the Española Basin, it's in the Tewa Basin. Um, and while we while they all speak the same language, they tend to do things in in kind of different ways. A lot because of the different kinds of resources that they have, and kind of their approach. And and because the communities are not they're not post postage stamp copies of each other. They're like family members. They each have different personalities, and so they their programs reflect that. And there's so much to talk about. There's so many things happening currently um, with projects and, you know, our leadership here in, in Jemez Pueblo expects, you know, the TIPO program or for that matter, the Department of Natural Resources here in Jemez Pueblo uh, to interact with those federal agencies on a daily basis, more or less, you know, we, we are, um, in collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service here with the Hamish Ranger District with uh, projects that are ongoing, proposed projects, uh, you know, our, our leadership expects us to give them feedback, comment on projects because, you know, we're, the ranger station here is, is pretty much right in the heart of the Hamish ancestral domain. Uh, you know, there I've, I've worked with the U.S. Forest Service in the past as in, you know, as documenting our archaeological sites. And, you know, from my account, uh, there are over 8,000 archaeological sites in the Hamish Ranger District alone. And majority of those sites are associated to the Hamish people. We're talking about large uh, ancestral pueblos. Um, field houses and, and other archaeological sites, not to mention traditional cultural properties, you know, those other features uh, in the landscape uh, that may not really stand out uh, to ordinary people as arch anything special, but to my people, these are special places uh, that have a, a special meaning to my people. And so our leadership, you know, pretty much um, trust us to handle those situations on a daily basis to make sure that our voice is heard, uh, to make sure that, you know, any of the projects are not adversely affecting the uh, cultural landscape 
uh, belonging uh, to the Hamas people in a spiritual sense, um, you know, some of the, the projects currently that, you know, involves our leadership uh, comes down to uh, consultation, uh, consultation with the uh, U.S. Forest Service, the Hamish Ranger District, or the, uh, the Santa Fe National Forest. Um, also, we, we work quite a bit with the National Park Service, uh, mainly uh, the Vice Caldero National Preserve uh, and uh, the Pecos uh, National Historical Park, um, which has, uh, you know, Hamas people's ties to, uh, it's, these are special and important places. Uh, but th those are just some that I mentioned. There are many others which, uh, you know, the, the other Pueblos would, would have as well. You know, we're, we're all in the same boat, pretty much. You know, we're, we're a minority trying to fight for our rights, protecting our cultural resources, and we want our voices heard. Uh, you know, as I stated uh, uh, in, in some of the uh, uh, consultation meetings, you know, we are a people, we, 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 are, we have a face, we, we have a heart. Uh, we, we're just not a, a name uh, on an archeological map. Uh, you know, we, we, we still have our traditions and our culture intact. Uh, we have a language. Uh, we want to preserve that tradition and culture into the future with our children. As Ben stated earlier, uh, the prayers that are said at ceremonies or our daily prayers, you know, that we always, always mention our ancestors that, that live in the ancestral homelands. You know, we're, we're requesting for their blessings to the people currently living and for those future generations that are not born yet. So we want to continue our way of life and, you know, we, we want to preserve uh, by protecting those resources that are currently out on the surface uh, on the lands managed by federal agencies. And, you know, there's a, a, a lot more meaning to these places than, than just uh, documents that are written about them. Uh, our people, and, and, you know, I think all Native people respect that, and we have that understanding that we have that connection uh, with our ancestors in these uh, cultural landscapes. Thanks, Chris, for those words. Um, I, I think it's an, important to, to show that or that you speak of that connection between the your Hamas homelands and the work that you do because they're kind of linked together your office and and the the landscape that you you're really trying to be a steward of um Bruce or Ben if you'd like to respond to that ahead. question in terms of uh, community focus sure uh, I'll I'll what, go ahead next Ben the, can have a Ben can have the last words okay. fittingly so a um I think that um we all have similar skills we have similar skill sets and responsibilities like those two to 300 consultation letters each year, working with federal and state agencies. And um, I think too, the more that our offices continue to work together, learn new ways of working together, I think it'll strengthen uh, the FIPO programs across the state and increase the, uh, amplify, increase the native voice about land and water. Um, uh, both tangible and intangibly, I think is really important. I think we have individual uh, uh, individual things we can do too. I think that's important. I think sometimes I take a consultation letter, actually in a meeting earlier today, Chris mentioned this, this particular place and they have a very particular situation where some research has gone on without consultation. So I felt that was someplace I could step in and talk to them being a museum person to another museum and I think they're doing a good job now of reaching out to the other communities uh, in that particular consultation. I think too, each community is, um, is, is uh, different. There's some similarities being uh, Tewa communities, but Kowalki's own history is very different than the other Tewa communities. I'm sorry, in some ways it's different than the other communities. Uh, it it, it uh, had a long, uh, difficult time with uh, colonial settlement in the state with Americanization and so forth. It also, like every other community from first colonization in 
1598 until the 1920s fell in population. Um, but Pewaukee fell to a much smaller number uh, than other communities and had to do things in order to survive. Things that I continue to admire about the community, about the strength and perseverance of the community that shows every day in the way the community lives, the way it governs itself, the way it uh, handles its opportunities. Pewaukee too, for many people, um, looks to be a community that's perhaps broken. It is certainly not at all broken. It is maybe changed like every community. Uh, you know, Mike mentioned uh, the labs. The lab has changed everyone in the Valley uh, without a doubt in some important ways. And um, so everybody has changed in some ways. Pewaukee's, the view of Pewaukee though is also different um, because people, 30,000 cars a day drive through Pewaukee and drive through um, what they think is the Pueblo. They think that, um, you know, McDonald's or Taco Bell is the community or Buffalo Thunders community. That's not, it is part of the community. And those are wonderfully well run tribal enterprises. But at the same time, that community where people live is up on top of the hill away from the public um, gaze at them. And so I think it creates a different, another type of way for the community. The other thing that happened to Pewaukee, which is a bit different, uh, which is similar, but the um, but the, uh, um, the sort of uh, amount of it is different for Pewaukee. And that's what we call the inholdings within the reservation boundaries uh, established uh, in the Spanish, Spanish two legs, two leagues each direction from the center of the village. And then uh, reified uh, at the beginning of the 20th century by the Collier administration in, inside of those 13,800 acres. Um, the Pueblo doesn't own all that land. There are inholdings, what we call inholdings. Those are private land holders, holdings inside the village itself. So that means that large ancestral villages like Cuyamangue, um, like Hakona or Sakona, uh, are, are on private lands now, private non-native lands. So that means we have a very different sort of situation. We also have, um, like the rest of the valley, a lot of people who move to the valley, I think Mike, phrase it a different way, he said about it's unconscionable that uh, a city like Los Alamos would happen without consultation. Well, a lot of people move into these properties without consultation per se, in the sense they don't quite understand that there's Pueblo land that surrounds them, they drive on it, their driveway might be on it. So um, most people are very accommodating and understanding of the Pueblo, but it has to be explained to them. Um, there's also 37 acequias on Pueblo lands, which is a large number of acequias, all with individual acequia associations. And those all need to be um, negotiated with at some point. Sometimes it's water shared. Um, sometimes the water goes to non-Pueblo farmers. So there's all these sorts of, 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 of forces always um, pointed at, at, the, at the Pueblo and for the Pueblo's uh, own being, uh, the way, again, the strength of the community, the, the abilities of the community, the intelligence of the community is always making the, um, wonderful things out of most of those circumstances. So it's a very different sort of place in that way. Thanks, Bruce, for providing that context um, of Pewaukee Pueblo and kind of the uniqueness of, of Pewaukee and like how it can provide kind of some insight into our own communities and how we do our work. I appreciate that. Uh, ben, you can either address the question I posed as far as um, community focus and what the leadership of the community um, expects from your office, or I can just leave it open to you because this is likely the last question uh, before we take a couple questions from the audience. So um, I'll, I'll leave it up to you, Ben. Okay. Um, thanks, Woody. Um, uh, I think everybody pretty much hit on the same note. Um, you know, Tipos, we again, focus, we try to focus and our main goal of uh, uh, preservation, uh, preserve, preserve and protect. But again, um, we get pulled in so many di directions because a TIPO, again, like, like I tell everybody is we're basically the umbrella over the whole Pueblo because everything the Pueblo does ties back. It all comes back to culture. Everything that we do, it's all coming back to cultural. It could be uh, anything you can have, um, you know, we deal with all generations, our senior citizens. Um, we deal with the, um, 
our uh, teenage uh, boys and girls, and we deal with even our younger age, our uh, Head Start and our grade school children. So our focus on that is, you know, again, we try to educate. Again, it is traditional. Um, we try to make sure that we try to enforce that. And there's so many different things, you know. Uh, again, number one on the list is language. You know, we see language going, uh, it, it's dropping in, in every single culture. And uh, that's something that's important. But again, everything connects to it. And that's something that how you strengthen that and learn it is you got to strengthen all the other parts. So what we do is we reinforce also, um, you know, we start teaching other parts of the culture, like reinforcing uh, different types of like, again, bringing back pottery making, artwork, uh, again, weaving, um, doing all these different things, moccasin making, flint napping, bow and arrow just baking bread, different things that you do in your daily lives. We try to bring everything back because everything you use will then strengthen and doing things makes you uh, improve your language. And one of our like most successful things that we've done so far is we've done uh, YCC where we've taken uh, 24 youth and we've had them do restoration on our ancestral home of Kuye cliff dwellings. And that, again, is a task within itself. That's a two month, uh, again, but you're dealing with 18, I mean, 14 to 24 year olds, all different personalities. And I, I give anybody that task to take on that in 100 degree weather, I may watch everybody. And again, uh, we do implement everything. Again, teaching them uh, masonry skills, team building, teamwork. Uh, but that's been a successful project for us, you know, helping them. Again, we do Thai language into that. We teach them the language. Uh, we even have our Tewa instructors come on site and teach them the language for a couple hours a week. So that one is one good way to reinforce. But another project we have is what we call the cultural survival kit, where we then take, um, it's kind of like the Boy Scouts, where we take a group of youth and as their chaperones, we take one of their parents and we take them to some of the ancestral villages all throughout the Southwest. And we teach them different things and they are paired with some of our traditional elders who then are their mentors and they teach both the parent and the, and, and the, the child uh, the culture. So both are being taught and then they're able to reinforce that at home as well. So that's one of our main things that we're trying to do is build back things. But that is something that uh, a lot of the, the interest has come because we've went into a uh, Southwest area. We're going to Bears Ears, to uh, Canyon of the Ancients, Mesa Verde. Uh, we're trying to go into Wupatki up in, in uh, Arizona. But again, we want to make sure that uh, we're trying to get all these places. We took them into uh, Gila Cliff Dwellings. Uh, Three Rivers Petroglyph sites. Uh, we're doing studies and then we do educational programs with them, uh, the seniors as well as the other generations on, uh, again, uh, petroglyphs, astronomy, and then even the technology. But that's just stuff that we focus on. And then again, like I said, all the work we do, we get pulled in on, uh, like, the section 106 all these cultures it gets really this is the hardest job i've taken because it is a double-edged sword you know when we're dealing in a, in an age where uh you know you have a good or bad you know uh you, you try to protect things but then in this age we're living you see the populations growing and you see the expansion of land and resources a lot of people in this day do not care about cultural resources. Again, uh, like I say, money is the root of all evil. And again, people see that price tag. And again, then cultural goes out the wind window. And that's something that's hard to protect because you see these things growing in a hard place where I can say is a lot of places we're doing a lot of section 106 is I could say is the city of Albuquerque. You know, everything is just growing and growing. And like we always told everybody, in the future, you know, stories that we're telling our younger generations now is you're gonna probably have cities connecting all the way and then you're gonna just actually see outlines of reservations because those are the only lands where it's gonna still be pristine. But, you know, that's just something that we see and something that we're trying to fight because we're always battling. 
not just with uh, federal, state, local, you know, we're seeing all this uh, with the oil drilling everywhere. You know, you go to um, uh, my biggest place is up north, uh, just adjacent to the Hickorya Reservation. And you can just look at that on a Google Earth map and just see those oil wells everywhere. We used to hunt there, do a lot of uh, camping and stuff. But again, you look at it now, you can't even look one direction. You see just oil and oil tanks and everything like that. But, uh, you know, that's just something we're doing and it's a, it's always going to be an ongoing effort. And that's one thing where I, I'm grateful that I have a cultural committee that guides me on my decisions, traditional leaders and uh, so community support. And most of all, a great staff that I work with, you know, it wouldn't be possible. But again, we're really shorthanded with all the work we do. And I commend every single TIPO. You know, every single tipple, not just us that are sitting here on the panel today, but every tipple that exists, because it is a hard job. But Kundawa, thank you. Thanks, Ben. I think that last point you made about um, kind of the limited resources and staff that tipples have is an important one. Um, and I think in the question and answer, I think there's um, ways to touch on that, that one point. So, I mean, look at the time, it's already six o'clock. Um, the time kind of flew. Obviously there's a lot to say, there's much more to say. Um, perhaps this warrants another panel in the future in this series, um, but I guess we'll, we'll visit that, um, that thought um, at a different time. So I'll just take a couple questions from the, from the chat here. One, one of the questions that was asked early on um, was about um, if there's any opposition from the community members or tribal councils to include oral traditions in written reports. And I think Ben, you've already talked about how your community um, incorporates um, uh, kind of oral traditions within some of the work you do. So Chris, maybe I'll just turn this question to you. Um, is there any opposition to maybe not just including oral traditions in some of the reports you produce, but maybe any kind of general opposition to some of the work we we do as TIPOs? Because there is the perception that um, historic preservation involves archaeology, which is like an inherently destructive um, practice. But our offices, obviously, as you guys have explained, do much more than just archaeology or anthropological type thing. So Chris, um, it, if uh, you could um, um, address that that question. Yeah, you know, it's, it's always a challenge at the community level with, you know, people, tribal members, you know, we're, we're pretty much set in our ways. Uh, if an individual wants to expand or build a house, you know, we're, we're telling them, you know, let's, let's do this. Uh, uh, cultural resource survey first, uh, and, and so you know that that will clear the land for you, so you can build your house there, or you can put the water lines in, or the sewer lines. But many times they don't want to do so because they they feel this is our land. Why should we have to do this and delay the the proposed construction another month or two months? Or sometimes when they're digging and they find something, you know. <laughs> We, we would like to document and, and maybe save that object, the artifact uh, for, the, for the people. But many times, like I said, you know, the, the land belongs to us, it's our ancestors. And, and if, if you do find an artifact, you know, that's a gift, that's a special uh, a find uh, for the individual, it's, it's good luck. And so many times, you know, in, in that sense, uh, there's an opposition happening. But at the leadership level, I, I think leadership is happy that we have this program running in which you know, we, we are supporting leadership and helping them in many situations. Uh, like I said, you know, during consultation meetings, we're there, we have a consistency. Uh, we've been there in the office, I've been there in the office since 2004. And you know, since 2004, a lot has happened. Uh, and, I, and I have colleagues there that have been there a long time as well. So leadership finds that uh, as a very important uh, asset uh, to, to have that memory or to have that consistency with what has happened 
in the past, and as far as oral traditions in, in uh, written reports, uh, I haven't seen any objection to that, but sometimes uh, they may feel that we're, we're uh, um, giving too much information. And in that sense, they may recommend, you know, to, to kind of more generalize uh, uh, maybe a section of the report that has a oral tradition or a tradition or culture uh, from the traditional perspective. So, you know, we're, we're working together and, you know, as Ben stated, we, we have our challenges, but it's a move forward, you know, it's a, a positive move forward for our people to manage our own cultural resources, uh, to have this program and to have our own say so. Uh, thanks, Chris, for that response. Um, moving on in the uh, questions in the Q&A, um, this one is more of a comment, but I'll ask for a response from either Bruce or Mike, um, the individual here who has 35 years of CRM uh, experience. And in his experience, most of the time consultation has been in one direction, uh, sadly, and that tribal concerns are too often, I think he meant to say not taken into consideration. So Mike or uh, Bruce care to comment on, on this term or this uh, kind of idea of consultation uh, what that actually means um, in regards to your experience at, as TIPOs? Thanks, Mike. You've been on both sides of that, so you can really give a good answer. Um, <clears throat> I think the real key is meaningful consultation. And I think that um, there, there is a consultation, but it's too often times it's like a checkbox. Did you talk to people? Check. It doesn't ask, did you listen to them? Did you hear what they had to say? Did you take their concerns? What did you do? To, what did you do in changing your work? And I think sometimes it comes down to this too, that um, the CRM work is already decided before you start talking to tribes. Um, so is it a really necessary project? So we had a recent project in the, um, in the Pewaukee Valley, actually it was came over from from Santa Clara, it was an electrical line project. And fortunately, we all got involved in that in a very early stage. And um, it, it ended up not being built, this, these electrical lines. So it was a meaningful consultation in, in terms of the back and forth in a project like that. I, I do think that um, uh, th there, there is some shift going on. Uh, I don't think it's quite there yet. Another example, I'd give another ready example is is this that um, so on the a water project in the Pewaukee Valley, the Amat project? Uh, so we're working with Bureau of Reclamation, and the Bureau of Rec Reclamation, even on tribal lands, is the lead agency over the tribes themselves. And what that means is, if there's a decision about mitigation, which is the terminology of an inadvertent discovery, BOR Bureau of Reclamation has the decision-making power how it's mitigated. Is more archeology span done to learn more about the find or is it reburied or whatever? Whereas in Pewaukee, my direction for the group I work with is no further excavation, no matter what. If we need to move something, we'll move it over. If we need to leave it in place and build over, there's another way to do that. But this idea of meaningful consultation can fall apart at the boundary uh, of the Pueblo's concern, even with the Thippo, uh, in the community, that, that idea of true meaningful consultation, the idea of really two, um, two equals speaking to one another. Now, the community may not know as much about archaeology as the CRM people um, or other agencies and so forth, but they certainly know a lot about their own ancestors and the place. So one of the things um, that the community relies on, even as an outsider in the community, there is a predicted this, you know where things go, you know where things are, you know before you have to walk to a place that there's going to be something there or there's not something there. Um, so it's no mystery, they wanna put water towers on tops of hills to make the projects work better, to make the water project work better. But every time they wanted to put a tower on top of a hill, of course, that's an area we didn't want something in. So it took a lot of back and forth to figure that out. Um, a little bit in the community too, to Chris's point, a little bit in the community, like don't stand in the way, we need the water project. 
but I think in the end, we came up with some excellent um, alternatives for people. Thanks, um, thanks, Bruce. Sure. Um, and we have uh, one question. I'll turn. I'll give this to you, Mike. Um, there's a question in the Q and A about the regarding the lack of resources for Tipos. Uh, they ask, is it a lack of funding um, or lack of interest um, that creates this lack of resources for Tipos uh, within our uh, programs? It's not a lack of interest. Uh, by any means. I mean, there obviously there are parties who who would rather not fund it. Um, I think in general, historic preservation is not funded to the level at which it should be. I mean, it's it's an inherently expensive enterprise, but it's like Ben and um, and Chris have said is is it it's really not about money. It's about the preservation of of the, the, the culture for those communities that need it. Um, hopefully that will change with, uh, with uh, Secretary Holland in place, I mean, at least an understanding. Um, I, the thing about funding, a lot of times when you talk strongly about funding, agencies or proponents for projects think they can throw money at things. And so it can look like a lot of money is being spent on consultation and preservation issues. And it's actually sometimes not just about the money, it's about what you do with the money or what you try to accomplish with other resources that may be available. It's not always about money. I mean, there are alternative forms of mitigation might be um, helping restore a historic structure or a, an, an important feature on the landscape for a community as opposed to um, doing the excavation of something that's in the direct path of a project. I, I have a really strong philosophy about, uh, not a philosophy, I have a strong feeling that for my, uh, for all of the efforts devoted to historic preservation since since this thing got started, whatever it is that we do for a living, um, has always been somewhat unsupported in financially because people don't understand how much it costs. But I think a lot of times the will is there. It's just that once they find out what it's going to take to enforce their will or to implement their will, it's the st it's sticker shock. Um, you know, kind of the kind of equal to the sticker shock of building a brand new water system from the Rio Grande all the way up the Rio Nambe and the Rio Tsuke. Um, is, it was a sticker shock for Congress. Um, we can always use more money, but I'm sure, I, I just feel like throwing money at things is not always the answer either. I mean, it's, it's the support is, is, is more critical, I think. And hopefully it'll change with, with having, I, I, I don't, I, I wanted to have a chance to say this. I think having Deb Holland as the Secretary of the Interior is much more important in terms of the people. Everybody said it in the newspaper and said it's a great and wonderful thing. Uh, this is the first time a Native person has ever been in charge of the agency that has wreaked so much destruction on Native peoples in this country, other than the Department of Defense and the Department of the Army. But the, but. This is a critical change for us, and hopefully it'll lead to significant changes in practice. Thanks, Mike. And um, you bring up an important, important um, news bit um, that I think is that I wanted to mention earlier, but I thought it'd be important to close with it. The, the confirmation of Deb Holland uh, as a cabinet secretary of the interior um, I think she should be congratulated and commended for that. Um, because like, like you said, um, Mike, the, uh, the Department of the Interior is charged with the conservation and protection of natural as well as cultural resources. Um, and I, I see her appointment as a start to maybe uh, some reform, real reform um, to that end. So we have, no time left, but I want to address a couple um, related questions in the chat. Um, I'll just go ahead and answer them and then we'll 
close it out um, after my, my brief response. So uh, one question in the chat uh, comments uh, says, in Santa Fe, preservation means freezing buildings in time, contributing to the gentrification as well as the continued stylistic appropriation of your cultures. Uh, do you see any opportunity for TIPOs to collaborate with Secretary Holland to reform historic preservation regulation across the country to better enable intangible preservation rather than our limited focus on old buildings? Related to that is a question, um, how do you imagine tribal consultation shifting, if any, with the newly appointed Secretary of Interior? Uh, both huge questions. Um, and I think um, the appointment of Deb Holland to the post that's at the very top of the bureaucratic chain uh, or uh, pyramid in which TIPOs are situated is an important one. But I, I think the, the real work is happening in historic preservation on the ground by folks like you, by folks in our communities. Um, and hopefully the, 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 the message and the importance of that work will trickle up rather than trickle down um, to uh, leadership um, throughout the Department of Interior and hopefully all the way up to uh, Madam Secretary. So Madam Secretary, if you're out there listening in the future, maybe perhaps on a recorded um, uh, uh, session, uh, if you're listening to this, um, we, we really hope that the, your appointment um, or her appointment as, um, as a cabinet secretary of the interior uh, will bring about some of the changes that many of us in Indian country uh, hope for. Um, and I think a lot of the, the work that we've highlighted here speaks to the importance of the uh, preservation and conservation of natural and cultural resources, which are interrelated, you know, we don't see those as as a separate um, entities. Um, so thank you all for um, your time this evening. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our participants. Thank you to um, those who submitted questions. Um, and I think this is going to be recorded and posted somewhere um, for future viewing. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed the program and stay tuned for future programs. Uh, we hope to have at least one of these a month on different uh, topics, like I mentioned. Uh, on the horizon is a talk on um, uh, some of the efforts uh, to preserve and conserve Oak Flat. That's on um, April 22nd, which is uh, no coincidence on Earth Day. So keep posted, look out for that announcement and again, Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll all see you guys soon.